Let us continue with our derivation of Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules. We have already stated what the rules for QED are and we will visualize them and understand where they come from with the help of a few examples. And here is the first example that we started to discuss yesterday where we have a process, the pseudo process, it doesn't really happen in reality, but a process where we have an incoming photon state which is created by a dagger of the photon field acting on the vacuum and the final state consisting of a positron and an electron created by creation operators D and B from the vacuum, but here it's uh, of course uh, reversed. And then we have one interaction vertex coming from one power of the interaction Lagrangian and uh, the interaction Lagrangian always enters via this exponential function e to the i integral of the interaction Lagrangian. Therefore there is this factor of i in front of the term representing the interaction Lagrangian which was minus e q psi bar gamma mu psi a mu. And uh, then we have seen that what we really need to do is we take any of the annihilation operators which automatically appear on the very left and use lots of commutation or anti-commutation relations until the annihilation operators are on the far right. Then they act onto the vacuum and give zero. Therefore, the only non-zero terms arise from particular commutators or anti-commutators. And for the B annihilation operator, for example, for the electron, if we do this procedure, then there is exactly one anti-commutator which is non-zero, namely the one between B and Psi bar, which we write as a contraction rule with this new notation. So if we would apply the anti-commutator, then we get anti-commutator of B with Psi bar minus the term where the B operator is here. And the B operator, if it's here, commutes with all the rest and acts on the vacuum to give zero. Therefore, that is the only non-vanishing contribution from the B term. And then what would remain after applying this rule is the expectation value of all the remaining uh, four operators. Then we do the same for D. That is a number, that is a number, then D anti-commutes with Psi to give something non-zero, which we write like this. After that, the D stands here, acts on the vacuum and gives zero. Then we do the same with A dagger. It gives a commutation relation with A mu, which is non-zero, and then A dagger acts on, to, on the vacuum on the left. And so the only non-vanishing contribution from A dagger is this one. And then we have only numbers. The vacuum expectation value of a number is the number itself. Therefore, from here, we get this final relationship where all of those contraction rules are well-defined expressions defined via the commutators of the corresponding quantities. And what we see here is a pure number. It, there is still an integral, so it's a non-trivial number which depends on all the momenta appearing here and the position x appearing in those field operators. And now, of course, we need to evaluate what those objects actually are. So that is our next step. We want to evaluate exactly those expressions here. So what, for example, is this contraction between an electron annihilation operator and a psi bar field? Of course, there are now arguments in those operators and we have suppressed them just to be brief, but it's important that the arguments are there. And uh, this thing here had, for example, the argument P1 prime and S1 prime for the spin and momentum of the outgoing electron. And that had the argument X for uh, the integration variable of the interaction Lagrangian. So the result will depend on X, P1 prime and S1 prime. And so what is the result? You can read it off from the commutation relations that you know from the creation annihilation operators and the representation of the field in terms of these operators. I will not copy again the uh, formula for the field operator because you should know it anyway by heart. Yep. Is 
this all? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Clear to everybody? Because that's the uh, term in the field operator. There is this term with B dagger. B dagger times U bar and this exponential. Uh, it has a plus because of the dagger here or bar. And of course, as usually, um, the anti-commutator between, between B and B dagger uh, cancels the measure factor from the integral, so the integral gets collapses, and all of these normalization factors drop out. It was always like this, and it's again the case here. And so this is what remains. And here you see the object appearing, which we have already stated as the Feynman rule for an outgoing electron with uh, this momentum and spin. So this already appears, and it indeed appears at the right place, because in this process, we do have an outgoing electron with this momentum. So we recover here the already stated Feynman rule. But there is also the exponential, which we have not stated in our Feynman rule, but it appears here in the calculation. Let us go on. No, sorry. What is this? So same question, so somebody else can answer it. <coughs> so this is the annihilation operator for the outgoing positron with momentum P2 prime S2 prime. That is the field with argument X. It has the usual representation in terms of B and D dagger. So what will happen? Right. Hmm? Exactly. And for the same reason. Okay. So finally, uh, a mu and a dagger. This is the creation operator for the photon with an incoming momentum. P, I think we have called it, just P and polarization lambda. The photon field at position X. And uh, this is defined as the commutator between the two. So what happens? So again, the same thing. What we get is the prefactor of the operator A inside of the photon field, and that is the polarization vector epsilon mu for the momentum p and polarization lambda, which comes from this, and times the exponential e to the minus ipx. And now it's minus because that is the coefficient in front of a without dagger. All right, so we see here what we have already stated, namely that was our Feynman rule for an outgoing positron with this momentum. So it's an outgoing positron. And the rule arises from the anti-commutator of the corresponding D operator with the field Psi. And that was our stated Feynman rule for an incoming photon with that momentum and polarization. But we have the additional exponential functions. And uh, so we need to look at what uh, they do. And what do they do? So we have now, if we plug in the expression, then this expression becomes, first of all, a product of all these wave functions. These are called wave functions. They appear here at, at these various places. And the exponential functions depend on the momenta and on x. But there is also still an integral over x, which we can now evaluate. And the evaluation is not very difficult because the integrand is only the product of the exponentials. What is the integral over the product of those exponentials? Integral d4x. The only x dependence is really exactly this. e to the i p1 prime plus p2 prime minus p times x. So you see naturally and automatically appearing an exponential where you have the sum of the outgoing momenta minus the sum of the incoming momenta times a variable x. You integrate over x. And what is the result of this 
famous integral. It, it's a delta function times 2 pi to the fourth power times delta four dimensional p1 prime plus p2 prime minus p. So that is this famous momentum conserving delta function, which I have already claimed, which always appears in the calculation of the S matrix element. And uh, it does appear here. And we defined what we call the T matrix element, which is the interesting rest, which is the interesting uh, rest without the delta function, which uh, preserves the momentum. So therefore, we can say our result of that expression here is equal to the following, two pi to the fourth power times this delta function. times a T matrix times I, where this I times the T matrix is given by all the rest, and the rest is given as follows, minus IEQ from here, times uh, that contraction, which is the wave function U bar times gamma mu times that contraction, and so on, so we have U bar of P uh, one prime S one prime times gamma mu times V of P two prime S two prime times the uh, wave function epsilon mu of P and lambda. That's it. And this is exactly our Feynman rule, which we have claimed for an incoming photon and an outgoing electron and an outgoing positron where the photon comes in with this momentum and polarization and the outgoing particles have those momenta and polarizations. Yes? The uh, Spinor multiplication is exactly like here. So, and uh, that was actually a remark that I wanted to make, and we should really fix that by writing it down explicitly. And uh, it's an important point. We have here in the initial expression a Spinor multiplication with Spinor indices, which we have suppressed. And uh, in the indices are Psi bar with an index, uh, then a matrix, four by four matrix, times a spinor again with four components. And the whole thing here has the spinor indices contracted so that there are no open spinor indices. And uh, that propagates in the next line. So here we have this expression, which is still a spinor valued, still at the same place to the left of the gamma matrix. And uh, that will be replaced by U bar. So the U bar carries over the spinor indices from here. Then that is multiplied with gamma mu. And then the next factor is the result of this, which is V. And that is exactly the same order of the spinor objects here. So it inherits the spinor structure from this psi bar gamma mu psi structure. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I see where it comes from. I feel like in the final rules, if I use the final rules, I think it's like the gamma mu would be on the other side. Ah, okay, uh, no, but, but that is now the point that we should write down. Namely, we learn from this discussion that in the Feynman rules, there is a certain order in which the factors need to be multiplied, and the order was not stated in the Feynman rules, and this is the order in which we should multiply the factors, and that is now an additional rule that we learn from this analysis here. So I will write it down in a few seconds. Let me just finish this uh, line, but I think I finished it. So this is the Feynman diagram, and uh, now you see the factors were stated. The factors correspond exactly to each other. Let me just also highlight the following point. The vertex, this dot here, had the rule minus IEQ gamma mu. Okay, the minus IEQ is of course a number, so you can multiply it anywhere, but the gamma mu must stand here in between the two spinor objects. And let me just again explain where this vertex rule comes from. So the i comes from the exponential function e to the i times l int. 
This is the I from here. And the other factor is minus E, Q, gamma, mu. They come from the term in the interaction Lagrangian, minus E, Q, gamma, mu, and so psi bar psi a mu. This is the interaction Lagrangian. So the vertex comes from the structure of the interaction Lagrangian where we have such terms with prefactors and so on. So the vertex rule in general is always the prefactor in the interaction Lagrangian of the field operators but times i. That is the general rule. Okay, and uh, so now we have understood this and let me indeed write down the uh, result of that analysis that you have provoked. Um, we get here an additional rule, namely, if we have such a vertex with some photon, then the uh, spin or um, Feynman rule factors are multiplied in the order against the arrow on the fermion line. So that is the general rule because there will be more factors appearing later from the propagator, for example. But we see it already here arising. So if you go against the arrow, then it means in this particular case, against the arrow, we start here at the fermion line. And the first expression that we encounter is the one for the outgoing electron, which is u bar. Then the next factor we encounter is the one for the vertex, gamma mu. Then the next factor is V for the outgoing uh, positron. And so that is the order in which we should multiply the factors and the rule arises from the initial structure of the interaction Lagrangian. And uh, as I said, the rule becomes, um, remains correct, but uh, there will be more cases because there are more complicated Feynman diagrams with inner fermion lines and so on but the rule will always remain correct. However, uh, I warn you, and you can write that down, it doesn't fit here, so you write it down yourself. Uh, this rule applies to many theories, but not to all theories, because there are theories which contain, for example, electrically neutral fermions, where the definition of the orientation of the arrow often does not make sense. And then in those theories, that rule cannot work, at least not in all Feynman diagrams. And then the correct thing to do in all cases is to go back to this initial structure and figure out how you should multiply spinor expressions, because that is always correct. And the rule is just uh, observed here, and it's valid for QED and also for the standard model, but not in all quantum field theories. Good. So from this example, we have understood uh, how such a Feynman diagram arises and let us quickly go to some further examples. First of all, let us uh, list here some further contractions. So there are some further cases. For example, I could write down B contracted with Psi and uh, the definition would be obvious. It would be the anti-commutator between the two. What is the result of the anti-commutator between these two? So somebody else. Yep. U times e to the minus ipx. Really? No. <laughs> exactly. So somebody else. Zero. Agreed? Yes. Zero. Okay, so let's write down some more. What else could we have, for example, psi bar with d dagger? So just all the other cases which could appear. Psi bar with d, no, with d dagger. What is that? Okay. No. Zero. Mm, are you sure? 
<laughs> okay, I fooled myself a little bit because I wanted it to turn out to be zero, but I mean, we should anyway, make, uh, we should list all of them and not all of them are zero. So these are not the only ones which are non-zero, that's the point. There are a few zero ones and a few non-zero ones. Right. So let's just put some P of S and then E to the uh, minus I P X. And so that would, uh, the D dagger, you imagine D dagger would come from an initial state with a positron in it because D dagger would appear in these expressions acting on the vacuum on the right. So this corresponds to an incoming positron and therefore you arise, you see arising the Feynman rule for an incoming positron is V bar. That is the only non-zero anti-commutator of a D dagger operator. Let's go on, other cases, B with Psi bar, B with Psi, D with Psi, Psi bar with D dagger and so on. So what other cases are there? B dagger with Psi, B dagger with Psi, the interpretation is an incoming electron with some momentum P and spin S, anti-commutator with a field Psi, zero or non-zero. Non-zero, right. the two times e to the minus Yeah. So, and that is the stated Feynman rule for an incoming electron. So let's go on. Then for example, Psi bar with B dagger. Psi bar with D dagger. Corresponding to the anti-commutator between the two. So that is now indeed zero. Yes. That is zero because Psi bar contains B dagger. B dagger with B dagger anti-commutes. So something else. Photon, for example, A with A mu, that is non-zero, and the result is then uh, epsilon mu star of P lambda times E to the plus IPX for an outgoing photon state, corresponding to our stated Feynman rule for an outgoing photon. And, okay. Some other possibilities, for example, something uh, crazy, let's say A with Psi. Corresponding to the commutator between A and Psi of X. A, the photon, and Psi, the electron field. What is that? Zero. Yes. But it's nevertheless important to know it and to uh, maybe uh, make it clear because uh, after all we need to know all the commutators between all objects appearing on the right because we need to know uh, we need to bring all the operators to the vacuum on the right or on the left and therefore all of these commutators appear and many of them are of course zero but certain particular ones are non-zero and they give the correct contributions which uh, give rise to the Feynman rules. So. Let's now look at another example. I propose to look at this E minus going into E minus and A mu. Again, at first order in the interaction. And we assume here, oops, assume that uh, the initial state momentum P1 is different from the final state momentum P1 prime. So the electron momentum here is first P1, then P1 prime, and that has momentum P2 prime. We assume that the momentum is different. Then what is the expression we need to write down for this? So we start with an initial state with an electron in it. So the initial state is created by B dagger with uh, argument P1 and S1. The final state is created by B uh, without dagger of P1 prime S1 prime and A of P2 prime lambda. Okay. And in between we have one power of the interaction Lagrangian times I 
i because of the exponential function, i times an integral over x, and then we have psi, uh, so minus i e q is the prefactor, and then psi bar gamma mu psi a mu, and all of them have argument x. All right. So what is the result of this? Again, we uh, do the same strategy. We take all of the annihilation operators on the far left and use many commutation or anti-commutation relations until the annihilation operators are on the far right and then they act on the vacuum and we get zero. And the non-zero contributions come from the commutation relations. And they are denoted by our contractions. So we now use this uh, symbolic notation. So let us start by looking at the A operator here. Then we use commutation relations. A commutes with psi bar. A commutes then with psi. Then suddenly the A stands here and we have still not changed our expression. Then we use the commutation relation between A and A mu and we denote that by this contraction notation. That symbolizes that we now look at the commutator between A and A mu. Then of course we get this commutator times all the rest plus the expression where the A operator stands here. So we get that plus the term where the A is here. In the term where the A is here, we get zero because that A commutes with all the rest acts on the vacuum, so that term actually vanishes. Therefore, the only thing that we get from the A is exactly this commutator. Then, after having evaluated the commutator, this thing here is a number. So the field operator is not there anymore, the A is not there anymore, and they are replaced by some number which we can read off from over there. So that number then must be evaluated. In order to evaluate the number, we have to evaluate the vacuum expectation value of the remaining operators. We apply the same strategy again. So we take then this annihilation operator B. Then the B commutes with everything until we are here. Then it hits the psi bar. So we get a contraction between B and psi bar, which was zero or non-zero. B and psi bar, psi bar contains B dagger, so that is not zero. So we get a non-zero contraction from here. Then uh, we get, this is the anti-commutator between the two. Afterwards we would get minus the term where the B operator stands here. If the B operator stands here, it commutes or anti-commutes with, uh, not, it doesn't commute with all the rest. So we get actually, it commutes, anti-commutes with psi. So we can pull it through here. Then the B operator stands here and it stands here with a plus in front. Stands here with a plus in front, so we get a second contribution from the B plus the anti-commutator between B and B dagger. They do not anti-commute, so this uh, gives a non-zero contribution. So from the B we get two terms, this one plus that term. Okay. And for each of them we now have to evaluate the rest. So what is uh, what about the rest? So if we are here, then we have the product of this commutator times that anti-commutator. Then there is still the remaining B dagger and uh, the remaining vacuum expectation value, which contains only two operators, namely psi and B dagger. And uh, the result is then simply that anti-commutator between the two, which will be a number. Then we have fully evaluated here one term from the full expression. And we see that this term is again a product of three contractions, which are is a product of three numbers, which we can afterwards uh, evaluate fully. 
But now the B has also produced a second contribution from the anti-commutator B with this B dagger here, which I write like this. And so to make it complete, we should now also evaluate that. We had already the A, so I write this like that. So then we get two sets of such full contractions. So the A was replaced by that commutator. B is replaced by this commutator between B and B dagger. And so that will be multiplied with the vacuum expectation value of the remaining two operators, which are psi and psi bar. So then we need a contraction between psi and psi bar coming from some anti-commutator between those two operators. So then, however, we have a new object. Let's write it here, new object. Uh, contraction between B and B dagger, which is obviously defined as the anti-commutator between B and B dagger. But uh, this would be a delta function between the two momenta, and we have assumed here uh, the momenta to be different, so I write it very shortly. That would be a delta function, which is here zero. And so here you would get some additional term, which uh, is only non-zero if uh, the initial state and the final state momentum are the same for one particle. And so that is what uh, generally appears. So you get additional contribution if some particles actually do not really participate in the scattering. And here we will ignore these terms. So let us focus on the interesting term, because that is an interesting term where all the momenta change, so all the particles participate in the interaction. So let me simply delete that. And let us go on with the interesting term. What is then the result of the interesting term? We can immediately write it down, minus i e q times the integral over x. And then we have a product of three such contractions. And what is the Spino order? We can immediately fix that as well. On the left, we have the contraction B with Psi bar. That is the outgoing Spino U bar of P1 prime S1 prime. Then gamma mu. Then we have here the contraction of Psi with B dagger. That is the rule for an incoming electron. Psi with B dagger gives u, u of P1 S1. And then we have the contraction of for the photon, A with A mu gives epsilon uh, mu star of P comma lambda, or P2 prime comma lambda. And then all the exponential functions. And the exponential functions again work like this, that from here and here for the outgoing particles, we get a plus in the exponent, p1 prime plus p2 prime. And for the incoming particle, we get a minus p1 times x. And then the integral over x again gives a delta function. So we get 2 pi to the fourth times a four dimensional delta function corresponding to momentum conservation times i times tfi, where this i times tfi is exactly given by the Feynman diagram for this process, which now looks like this. We have an incoming electron with momentum p1 s1, an outgoing electron with momentum p1 prime s1 prime, and an outgoing photon with momentum p2 prime and spin lambda. <coughs> and our Feynman rules again exactly correspond to this. And again, we see a confirmation of the ordering rule. Namely, we go against the arrow on the fermion line, and then we get first the u bar for the outgoing electron, then the gamma mu from the vertex, and then the u for the incoming electron. But up to this order, which is now fixed, the Feynman rule exactly corresponds to our stated rules. So as a result of this, we may say, I think, that we have fully understood where the external lines 
and the vertex factor comes from. And generally, you may always say for an external incoming um, particle, you always get a structure like this. You have an incoming A decker operator for any particle type and some field operator phi which contains the corresponding A inside of it. And then you get a contraction and this will always give rise to the rule for the incoming uh, particle. And for outgoing particles, you have on the left an operator of the type A, which somehow hits a field operator phi, which contains the corresponding A dagger, and that contraction will give rise to the outgoing Feynman rule. And so the, it works like this for the electron, positron, and photon, and it will also work like this for all other types of particles that you might encounter in your life. So what remains to be understood is the inner lines, the propagators. So now let us look at some other example, which is a simpler example, non-QED. Just to illustrate where that might come from. Let us look at the following matrix element. Okay, so this corresponds to, let's say, a process where in the initial state we have an electron created by B Decker acting on the vacuum. In the final state, we also have an electron created by B. And in between, we have something like two powers of the interaction. And remember, we had this time-ordered exponential function. So at the second order, we will get two powers of the interaction Lagrangian with a T product. And so here I write just uh, factors psi of x and psi bar of y. So this is not the full interaction of QED. But in QED, uh, something like this will appear, but just multiplied with even more field operators. So let us look just at this simplified expression where we have a T product and two field operators in between. And uh, so this is a simple model for what really happens in QED. So but let us look what uh, results if we evaluate such an expression. So we have now two vertices in the theory, uh, in the Feynman diagram, and uh, therefore we might get something like an inner line connecting the two vertices. Okay, let's literally evaluate this expression. And so here uh, we can, for example, really write down what is the time ordering. We have a theta function of x0 minus y0 for one time ordering. <coughs> Okay, then minus the opposite theta function for the opposite time ordering. Uh, y minus, minus because we have a time ordering of fermionic operators and therefore the opposite time order gets a minus. Then, please note uh, the spin was structure. In the initial expression, we have written psi psi bar. That is meant to mean that the spin or indices are open indices. They are not contracted. So this expression has two open spin or indices, which we suppress. But they are open and not contracted. So here again, the spin or indices are not contracted. And here, it looks like a spin or product, but the indices still mean the same as before, so they are not contracted. This is not meant as a product psi bar psi, where the indices are contracted in the usual way, but the indices mean the same as in the previous expressions. Okay, so now we can evaluate the expressions in the same way as before. 
And uh, okay, so let's do it. The first one. If we evaluate it, then literally we get the following. And now I will write down even terms which are actually zero just to uh, illustrate the structure better. So we take again the B and then we get anti-commutator B with Psi, then B is here, then anti-commutator B with Psi bar, then anti-commutator B with B dagger. So we get in contraction notation, we get this times the remaining vacuum expectation value of Psi bar and B dagger. Right, but that is just the contraction of psi bar with B dagger. So that is the term from the first anti-commutator. After evaluating this, B stands at this position. Then we anti-commute B with psi bar. So first of all, we get a minus because of the anti-commutator minus. Then we get a contraction B with psi bar from here times the contraction of psi with B dagger. Then after evaluating this, B stands at this point and we have a plus again. So then we get a contraction B with B dagger. In other words, the anti-commutator between those two times the vacuum expectation value of psi psi bar. And then after evaluating this, B stands here and it acts on the vacuum and we get zero. So the result of the first line is, is exactly those three terms. Some of them might be zero, but it's exactly the sum of these three terms. Then the next line minus the other theta function times what? Okay, same thing. We start with B here. We do the anti-commutator and we obtain this anti-commutator times the vacuum expectation value of the rest, which is the contraction between psi with B dagger. After evaluating this, we get a minus and B stands here. B stands here, so we get the anti-commutator of B with psi, the contraction B with psi, times the remaining vacuum expectation value of psi bar and B dagger, which is this contraction. After evaluating this, B stands here and we get a plus again. B stands here, so we get the contraction B with B dagger times the remaining vacuum expectation value of psi psi bar. And what happens if you now sum up the two lines? What happens if you sum up the two lines? So you discover some equal terms. Where are some equal terms? For example, this term is equal to which one? The second one. And what happens if you add up the two? Look at the prefactors. Don't you see anything happening? What is the prefactor in the first and the second line? Uh, think again, please. Where is the different sign? Please look carefully at the exact prefactor of the red term here. It's a, plus. it's a plus, minus times minus. Don't you see the second minus here? Minus times minus gives plus. What could be the sum of these two theta functions? What's the sum of these two theta functions? So what is the overall result summing up the two red things? It's just the red thing itself without any prefactor or with prefactor one. So we get just the red term B psi, psi bar 
P dagger. Okay, so new color. Now the green terms. What about the green terms? And the theta functions, what happens with them? Yeah. The theta functions drop out. Okay. So for the contractions where the field operator psi psi bar is contracted with an external uh, particle, the theta functions just drop out so the time ordering doesn't matter anymore for those contractions. So just the different time order terms add up uh, to the corresponding expression without time ordering. What happens now to the remaining terms? Yeah, look at it and think about it. What's the result of the remaining stuff? Yes, and uh, the overall sign is plus. And so we can combine the two, including the theta functions, just to write it like this. Okay. So we can pull the time ordering into this remaining expectation value, and then we have a very nice expression, which is the so-called propagator uh, between two field operators, a time-ordered product of the vacuum expectation value of two field operators. So, and this thing will be now our main object of interest and what you see from this small exercise are two things. Namely, first of all, uh, as I already said, the time ordering in the contraction between external field and internal, uh, external particle and internal field operator, that drops out automatically, but uh, the time ordering of a contraction between two inner operators that just remains. And so overall, we get a new expression, which we write as a new contraction rule. Psi psi bar contraction is defined as this. Okay. And actually, uh, so let us do a few ways to rewrite this. Um, ah, uh, okay, no, let's not do it, but you could rewrite it in a few ways, but then you would have to introduce the theta functions again. Uh, let's not uh, bother us with this, but uh, let's also record the corresponding definition, of course, for the photon field operator and similarly you could uh, define any contraction in any quantum field theory of a product of two such field operators. And therefore now our next task is actually to calculate such an object which is called the propagator and that will correspond to the internal lines in Feynman diagrams. So three, three, five. Uh, very simple derivation of the propagator. So let us introduce the definition uh, curly P of X minus Y times I is defined as this time ordered product uh, that we just defined as the contraction. And it is clear that it depends only on the difference between the two arguments because of translational invariance. So um, that is what we want to calculate. And so let's uh, look at, first of all, the Lagrangian for the corresponding field L0, the free Lagrangian for the Dirac field. 
can be written as psi bar times curly D times psi, where the curly D is now a differential operator. So we write the Lagrangian generally as a bilinear expression in the fields, and between the fields we have some differential operator, which in this case is I D slash minus M. And you can always bring the Lagrangian into this form, even for the photon or for other fields, for scalar fields. Uh, you can always do that. And uh, for the Dirac field, it's particularly simple. This is our differential operator. Then our field operator has an equation of motion. The Dirac field operator satisfies the equation of motion that this differential operator acting on the field gives zero. And the same would be true for the photon field with a corresponding differential operator. We also have a commutation relation, which is in the Dirac case, anti-commutator of psi of x with psi dagger of y, or let's do psi bar of y anti-commutator is equal to a delta function in three dimensions, x minus y, for equal times, times gamma mu. And without gamma mu um, is when we do here psi dagger. Then we have a product rule for time derivatives. If we uh, now want to get some information on this propagator expression here in the top. One particularly interesting point is to take the time derivative of it because there the time ordering matters. The time ordering contains theta functions depending on time and uh, their derivative with respect to time gives something interesting. So let us evaluate the time derivative of the object. D zero of I times P of x minus y. And so when I write a D, this is always respect, with respect to x. Okay, so this is the time derivative of this whole thing. Theta of x zero minus y zero times the expression with psi psi bar minus theta of the opposite times the opposite order. Okay, but now, what's the product rule? We get one term coming from the time derivatives of the theta functions, and one term from the time derivatives acting on the field operator. So what is the result if the time derivative acts on the uh, theta functions? Then the derivative of the theta function is what? A delta function of the same argument, delta of x zero minus y zero. So we get here the delta function times uh, this expression and here we get minus that same delta function, uh, sorry, minus square the same delta function. So we get plus the same delta function. So we get an inner minus from the inner derivative and an outer minus from that minus. So we get plus the same delta function. Therefore, the prefactor of the um, delta function is what? What is the prefactor of this delta function? It is this expectation value plus that expectation value. What does it mean? It means the expectation value of the anti-commutator of psi and psi bar. That is the expectation value of the anti-commutator, which we happen to know, by the way. But uh, let's continue with the product rule. So what is the other term in the product rule? Then we get a term where the derivative acts onto the field operator psi. And then we can pull it into the expect, uh, expectation value. And it multiplies here with a theta function, and here we get this derivative multiplied with the other theta function, so we can just write the other term as the time-ordered product of the time derivative of psi 
with psi bar and so on. So then we have a nice looking final result. So that is our product rule. If we take the time derivative of the time ordered product, we get one term with a delta function and an anti-commutator and uh, the other, the obvious term where the derivative is just inside of it. So what is now the result? Uh, let's first, the field operator satisfies this uh, simple equation with a differential operator and a zero on the right hand side. And our question is what happens if you act with the same differential operator onto that propagator? So this is zero and what is that? What is this? So in this expression, there appears a differential operator and the differential operator contains a time derivative, but also spatial derivatives. The spatial derivatives can be pulled inside of the t-ordering immediately because there is absolutely no interference between spatial derivatives and theta functions with respect to time. And for the time derivative, we get the product rule. So we get one term where the time derivative is also just inside of the time ordering and an extra term. For the mass, that is just a multiplicative factor. So overall, we get the following. Uh, the expectation value of the time ordering where the entire differential operator acts onto the field operator plus one single extra term, namely the term from the product rule where the time derivative acts onto the theta functions. That is the only extra term. And this extra term is now the following. We get an additional i times gamma mu i times gamma zero because the time derivative is here multiplied with i times gamma zero times that thing from here, which is a delta function of x zero minus y zero times the expectation value of the anti-commutator. But what is the anti-commutator? The anti-commutator is a delta function in three dimensions of x vector minus y vector times gamma mu. So what is the first line? The first line is of course zero because that was the defining equation of motion for the field operator. So that is zero and in the second line the gamma mu cancel and we overall have a four dimensional delta function of x minus y times i. So we see if you start out with a theory where the field operator satisfies this equation of motion, then the time ordered product satisfies almost the same equation of motion, but you get a delta function on the right hand side. So in mathematical terms, this propagator is a green function for the differential operator. So in simple terms, d times p is a four-dimensional delta function. And so, of course, you can now uh, calculate it in Fourier space if we define, how do we define it? In the following way, p of x minus y is written as a Fourier integral d4q divided by 2 pi to the fourth power times e to the minus iq times x minus y times p tilde of q, okay? then under this Fourier transformation, a derivative i times d becomes the momentum q. So i times d becomes q. That is the general rule. So in our differential operator, i times derivative becomes the momentum q. Therefore, in momentum space, we get the differential equation uh, q slash minus m acting on the Fourier transformed propagator gives the Fourier transformation of the delta function, which is one. And so then our Fourier transformed propagator satisfies this. So the propagator is the inverse 
of the differential operator in momentum space. So, and what you can do as an exercise if uh, you now understand uh, how this works. And goes uh, for the photon. There we have uh, the differential operator is actually um, the Laplace operator, uh, more precisely speaking, plus or minus. It is, we have, okay, let's write it down, the Lagrangian L0 can be written as one half times A mu G mu nu Laplace times A nu. You get this from partial integration. And so the differential operator is now a matrix in Lorentz indices G mu nu times Laplace. And so then, of course, the corresponding uh, equation would be this differential operator, d mu nu, let's say, d mu nu times i times propagator p mu nu is equal to i times a delta function in four dimensions times uh, nu rho, g mu rho. That would be the equation satisfied by the propagator and in momentum space we would get the Fourier transform differential operator times I times or without I Fourier transform propagator is just G mu rho. And uh, so this is then of course the Fourier transformation of the Laplace operator if I times a derivative becomes a momentum. Laplace becomes minus Q square. So we have minus G mu nu times Q square times the photon propagator gives uh, the identity matrix. And therefore, the photon propagator is the following. I times P nu rho Fourier transformation is equal to minus i times g nu rho divided by q square, where, of course, in position space, the definition is this. So then you have the result for the photon propagator using the same logic. And you can do that also as an exercise. It's a little bit uh, more involved than uh, the fermion case because you have second derivatives, but the strategy is exactly the same. And you see from this that uh, you can guess a general rule for all quantum field theories. The same strategy will always work. There are some subtleties involved, which I will explain to you later, maybe next semester. But uh, generally speaking, this is a correct strategy for all uh, free quantum field theories. Good. So then we have understood uh, where the quantum field theoretical expressions for our inner lines come from. Namely, the internal lines of Feynman diagrams correspond to those propagators defined as a time-ordered product of two fields and the vacuum expectation value of it. And they are always green functions of the corresponding differential operators can be calculated in this way in momentum space. Okay, and now let us finally come to some further examples which uh, really collect all of these uh, bits and pieces that we have uh, now understood to solidify our understanding. So maybe let us start at the other. Let us use Compton scattering as our next example. That is, of course, an actually really important process, which we will later also discuss from the physics point of view. But let's first look at the Feynman diagrams. Compton scattering means 
E minus photon to E minus photon. And I claim that uh, at uh, the second order of the interaction Lagrangian, so two powers in the exponential series, we get the following two Feynman diagrams, namely uh, this Feynman diagram. So this Feynman diagram plus a second Feynman diagram where the two photon lines are exchanged. So we get exactly the sum of these two Feynman diagrams and let's be precise and label all the momenta. So here incoming is the momentum P1 uh, for the electron S1. Uh, here the momentum K1, let me call it K1 here, and outgoing K2 and P2 for the outgoing photon and electron momenta. And at each vertex we have momentum conservation, that means the momentum Q, which flows here from the left to right in this line, is equal to P1 plus K1. It is also equal to K2 plus P2 uh, because we have also momentum conservation at the external, uh, at the second vertex. And that of course also means that the initial state and final state overall momenta are equal, which they must be because of momentum conservation. Then here again, we have P1 and S1. Here we have P2, S2. And here we also have K1 going into this photon line. And here we have K2 going out of that photon line. And so what does it mean? This outgoing photon couples to the incoming electron and the incoming photon couples to the outgoing electron. Therefore, what is the momentum which flows from left to right in this line Q? That is now by momentum conservation P1 minus K2. Okay. And it is also uh, momentum conservation here equal to P2 minus K1. And uh, that is also compatible with overall momentum conservation. If you rewrite uh, this equality here, uh, it's equivalent to that equality. So that is our claim and we will now prove that claim by writing down explicitly the matrix element for this uh, S matrix and evaluating all the contractions until we see that exactly these two Feynman diagrams arise. So maybe let us uh, write maybe our initial expression into this box here. So what happens at order L int square. The first change compared to the first order is that our exponential series e to the i L int gives us a factor 1 over 2 factorial because that's the second order in the exponential power series. Right? That is from e to the i L int evaluated at second order. Then uh, maybe we already put into the front from each L int we get minus E I E Q overall square. That is also from each of those L int factors. The I again comes from this I in front and the minus E Q comes from the coefficient in the Lagrangian. And all of that is number valued so we can pull it out of any matrix element. Then we have here now our big matrix element and a vacuum on the left and right and then for the initial state we have an electron and photon creation operator. So let's write them down. Creation operator B dagger and A dagger. And I suppress the arguments. The arguments would be a B dagger of 
P1, S1, and A dagger of K1 and lambda 1. And here for the final state, we have B and A. The argument of B would be P2, S2. The argument of A would be K2 and lambda 2. Then, okay, should I write the arguments? Okay. P2, S2, P, uh, K2, lambda 2, and here similarly. Then what else do we have? Now we really have the time ordered product of two interaction Lagrangians. So the, we have the S operator is this time ordered product of this exponential series. And now we have two integrals let's say integral over x and y, a time ordering between two powers of the interaction Lagrangian. So we write down two powers of the interaction Lagrangian, psi bar, gamma mu, psi, a mu, and all of these fields have arguments x from the first power of the interaction Lagrangian. Then psi bar, gamma nu, psi, a nu, and all of those fields have arguments y from the second power of the interaction Lagrangian. Okay. And so, though we will drop the arguments, but they are different for the different fields. These three have the same argument, those three have the same argument, but x and y. And uh, there is a time ordering, so we don't know what is actually the order of these two overall factors, but we have to write them down in this way. Okay, now what we need to do is to evaluate this by applying our same strategy as always. We pick one of the annihilation operators on the far left, and then evaluate all the commutators or anti-commutators until the annihilation operator hits the vacuum on the right. And so we pick up a few commutators and uh, each commutator is a number which can be treated later and then there remains an expectation value of all the remaining operators which is evaluated in the same way. So it's basically like a recursion. For example, we can pick the B. The B uh, is on the very, very far left, and then we do the commutator with A that gives zero, then it hits the psi bar, that gives something, then it goes on, it hits the psi, gives uh, zero, but an anti-commutator, and then it hits the other psi bar, which again gives something, then we go on, then it hits the B bar, B dagger, which also gives something, and then it hits the vacuum and we get zero. So we get three times a non-zero contribution just from the B. And for each of those contributions, we then have to do the same with the A. And for each term of the A, we then have to do the same with the B dagger and the A dagger. So overall, the, what will happen is that we need to find expressions where each operator is contracted with exactly one second operator. So all the non-zero uh, expressions in the final result contain products of contractions of two objects. Each object must be contracted with another one Anything which is uncontracted remains standing here in the expression and in the end hits the vacuum. So what we need to achieve is what we might call full contractions, a product of contractions where everything is contracted with something else. Everything can only be contracted with one other object, but every non-vanishing term must be a product of only contractions. And therefore, uh, the final result will be the sum of all possible combinations where everything is contracted with exactly one other thing. And that is what we need to write down. So let me, uh, up to the prefactors, vacuum, B, A, 
Psi bar, gamma mu, psi, a mu, psi bar, gamma nu, psi, a nu, b decker, a decker, vacuum. So let me write the strategy here. Result is equal to the sum of all possible terms where each operator is contracted with one other operator. That is the point. And so now we can visualize the result by just writing down with our contraction notation with brackets which terms there are. So, for example, the B appears in this way. B, the first non-zero term from the B is this one. It means the anti-commutator of B with psi bar. Then we would get a plus somewhere down here, plus the term where B is contracted with that psi. Okay? So this is the sum. This term plus that term, and then much further below, the term where the B is contracted with the B dagger. And then for each of those terms, there remains a vacuum expectation value of all the other operators. So let's evaluate for the first case. B is contracted with this, so this is a number. Let's evaluate the rest for this case. Then we get, we deal with A. A can be contracted with this A mu. Plus the term where A then stands here, then this hits this A mu. So we get this plus somewhere A contracted with this A mu. And in this term here, the B is still contracted with a psi bar. Then we get for, from the A, the term where A stands here, then we still get a non-zero term plus where the A is contracted with the A decker. And that is still inside of the term where the B was contracted with psi bar. Okay, so this is a sum, first the sum of all non-vanishing commutators with B, and then for each of them, the sum of all non-vanishing commutators with A. So let's consider the first term for B times the first term for A. We still have a remaining vacuum expectation value of this times that times this times that times this times this. So what's the result of that? So we get, for example, from uh, the A here, uh, this A dagger must be contracted with something non-vanishing and the only thing that can be contracted with is the remaining photon field A nu. So that's the only non-vanishing term for this A. Then for the B, B dagger, uh, B dagger gives something non-zero with psi. So there are two non-vanishing terms, namely this term plus the term where B dagger is contracted with this psi. So, and in this term, we repeat all the other already fixed contractions. Uh, sorry, A with A dagger. Okay. So then, we have actually now. Uh, have we evaluated it? No. So this first term, what remains? In the first term, we have dealt with A dagger, we have dealt with B dagger, we have dealt with B and A, but something remains, namely this psi with psi bar. And so we, but that is now unique, we get a contraction between psi with psi bar, which will give us the propagator. So here we will now get a time ordered product of the vacuum expectation value of psi with psi bar, which is the propagator. So, and then we have our first full contraction 
Everything is contracted with exactly one other thing, and the whole result is a product of numbers which we can write down later. So, and we have already seen here a second uh, term. So we have dealt with B, we have dealt with A, we have dealt with A dagger and with B dagger. B dagger goes from here to what has happened here? Uh, It goes to Psi, and the A is connected with that A. Okay. So then, is this a full contraction? No, because something uh, must be still open. That Psi here, Psi bar, and this Psi, they are not yet contracted, so we need to contract them as well. And then here we have a second full contraction. First term, second term, and then let us go on. Our next thing was we have fixed the B with Psi bar, and we have fixed the A with uh, that A nu. And so now we have to do similar strategy with the rest. So what can now happen with this A? A must be contracted with the A mu, because that's the only non-vanishing thing doing something with a photon. A with A mu. And what remains? We have dealt with B, we have dealt with A, with Psi bar. And uh, so let's look on the right. We need to do something with B dagger and A dagger. So A dagger. Ah, no, we did have actually two options for the photon. A dagger now goes to what have I done? I think we contracted the first A twice. Right. Sorry about that. B with Psi. This A was actually fixed. That was the point of this with A dagger. Therefore, this A dagger must go to A mu. So then B dagger. B dagger two options probably. It could go to Psi. It could go to Psi. Or it could alternatively go to the other Psi. But now it becomes a little bit um, messy. Uh, So I think you understand that in the end we need, so, so what I tried to show you in the beginning was the structure, how it is emerging, because it's like um, a product, right? It's like uh, you factor out the procedure. You first decide what you do with B, and there are a few options. B with Psi bar gives us a bunch of options for the rest. Then here there are all the options where B does something with the other Psi bar, and then there are many options for the rest. And then there was the first decision B with B dagger that starts here, and then many options for the rest. And then we dealt only with the first option for B and with all the other options for the rest. But in the end, you get really a sum of terms where just all combinations where everything is contracted with exactly one other thing. And so we can maybe now, at least here on the blackboard, I can do it. We can remove those other options, uh, which I wrote there to illustrate to you the overall procedure. But let us now simply write down systematically uh, with uh, the appropriate spacing uh, all the full contractions. And so now we have here started B with Psi bar, the A with the second A nu. Then B dagger with Psi, A dagger with the first A mu, and then what remains? What remains is Psi with Psi bar. Then next, B is still with the same Psi bar, and uh, 
I, I think uh, actually I'm a little bit confused myself. The best thing is of course now to uh, take stock and write down the Feynman diagrams what this corresponds to because let's picture what this contraction actually means. So what does it mean? Uh, let's start from the right. So the incoming photon, the incoming photon goes to the vertex at the position y. And it connects with the photon field A nu here. The incoming electron also goes to the vertex at the position y. So the incoming electron goes to the same vertex at the same position and it contracts with this uh, electron field psi. Then uh, the field operator psi bar at the position y is contracted with the field operator psi at position x. So we get a contraction between the two vertices at y and x from this contraction here. Then at the second vertex at position x uh, the outgoing electron is connected and the outgoing photon is connected. So we get exactly this Bert Feynman diagram which we wrote first at the top. This is the Feynman diagram corresponding to exactly this contraction here. What is the meaning of the second contraction? Again, we have here the vertex at position y and the photon is connected to the vertex at position y. The incoming electron, however, is connected to the vertex at position x. Then the uh, electron at the vertex y is connected to the electron again at the vertex y. So we get this sort of thing. A line which starts at y and ends at y. This is this. Then uh, at the position x the electron field is connected the photon is connected to the outgoing photon. And that is this contraction and this contraction is the outgoing positron uh, electron. So we get this Feynman diagram. We have not written it down at the top, but this is clearly the Feynman diagram arising from this contraction here. Can you imagine why this Feynman diagram gives zero, its result is zero. Why could that be? Actually it's zero under a certain physical condition. Yeah. Yes, momentum conservation because here the photon if it has a non-zero momentum cannot end just in this line which doesn't carry on the momentum. So for momentum conservation, if at least the momenta are all non-zero, then uh, this vanishes. But it corresponds to that contraction. So then the third, here the incoming uh, electron connects to the vertex at position y. The incoming photon connects to the vertex at x then the um, two vertices are connected by an electron line. This is this contraction. The outgoing electron connects to X and the outgoing photon connects to Y. So that is this contraction. This looks like the second Feynman diagram we had at the top. And then it goes on. So it goes on and maybe it is actually easiest to really say uh, we have in addition all further full contractions of the same kind and therefore we get further Feynman diagrams. And so for example we would get another Feynman diagram which looks like this but mirrored. So we would get, uh, uh, let's say, this sort of thing also. 
which is also zero for the same reason. So that would also be a contraction which arises. And uh, so that would be the fourth in our list. And then we get further contractions where the role of x and y is exchanged. In all the contractions so far, we have fixed that the outgoing electron is always contracted with a field psi bar at x. And then there would be a large bunch of contractions where the outgoing electron is contracted with psi bar at position y. And so there would be exactly the counterpart of all of these contractions where just the role of x and y is overall exchanged. But x and y are integration variables. Therefore, the overall result for all of the contractions where it's contracted with x and the ones with y, they are equal. They are mathematically equal because it's just an exchange of integration variables. Therefore, the sum of all of those contractions where B is contracted with this and the sum of all of them where it's contracted with that, they are the same. And so we will get identically looking Feynman diagrams except that uh, x and y are replaced here, which are anyway integrated over. And therefore, when we write down Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules, we do not distinguish between x and y, since anyway, on, and the, on the level of Feynman diagrams, uh, x and y variables have no meaning anymore. So we just write down one such Feynman diagram and integrate over the two vertex positions. And that factor two cancels the one over two factorial from here. And that is a very natural cancellation because you always see that even at higher orders you have n vertices. You get one over n factorial. And so you have n factorial different orderings of the vertices which all correspond to exchanging just the role of the integration variables. Therefore, naturally, this one over n factorial is always cancelled. Um, because there will be a number of n factorial identical Feynman diagrams, we write down only one of them and do not write down the factor 1 over n factorial. That's why this doesn't appear in our list of Feynman rules. So, ah, time is up. So let me just write down the conclusion. I think there is no particularly big conclusion. Uh, in the next lecture, we will do a little bit more details for even maybe one or two further smaller examples, maybe not on the same detailed level. But as a final word for this lecture, we have now seen, with the help of this example, how the contractions work in general. You see that uh, for each such matrix element with an arbitrary number of interactions and an arbitrary number of initial and final state particles, the same strategy will always work. You will always need to get uh, the full set of all possible uh, combinations of so-called full contractions. And all of the full contractions will give rise to Feynman diagram structures which contain exactly the three kinds of elements. There are external lines from contractions of those operators with fields. There are internal lines from such contractions which give rise to the propagators. And uh, there are vertex factors simply coming from the objects like gamma mu or minus IEQ uh, from the coefficients which appear inside of the interaction Lagrangian. And therefore, each such full contraction corresponds to a product of lines and vertices oriented in all possible ways. And therefore, instead of saying we need to write down the list of full contractions, you can say you need to write down the list of all possible diagrams which correspond to all possible ways to connect the two vertices with uh, the external lines in all ways which are geometrically possible. And that contains, for example, such strange possibilities. They exist, but in the end, they give zero for physics reasons. But uh, on the contraction level, you have all those possibilities. And so this strategy works, and you 
kind of probably clearly see uh, that in this way the Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules are actually explained. I will nevertheless say a few more details, uh, for example, on this uh, factor, one over two factorial and some other details, but that is then for the next lecture and so uh, we will stop here. Thanks and see you on Thursday.